I'm Sarah Wyant, the founder and editor of AgriPulse Communications, and we're very pleased to sponsor this event here today. I'm also very pleased to see such strong interest in our topic, digging into the ag export supply chain crisis and how to fix it. We have over 1,200 people registered virtually and a few more folks who are socially distanced within our room. As most of you have seen, no part of the transportation sector has been spared from supply chain disruptions. Higher rates and shipping delays often hit farmers and food companies especially hard. A survey recently conducted by the Agricultural Transportation Coalition found that on average, 22% of U.S. agriculture foreign sales could not be completed doing, due to a long list of ocean carrier practices, including exorbitant freight rates and declined booking requests. Members of the coalition, which include dozens of major farm and food companies, say they are losing customers to foreign, in foreign markets. Of course, all of these concerns are getting noticed, and last night, Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack announced plans to increase capacity at the Port of Oakland and improve service for U.S. exporters, and we're really looking forward to having him join us and share more on that. At the same time, as AgriPulse reported last week, Senators Amy Klobuchar and John Thune are in the final stages of releasing the Senate version of a bill to improve port conditions for agricultural exports. The House version passed in December by a large margin of 364 to 60 with strong support from the ag sector. And again, we hope to hear more on that uh, from our members of Congress who will be joining us later today. But before I introduce our first speakers, just a couple of housekeeping details for the people in the room. Please make sure to silence your phones. And for all of you who are joining us virtually, please remember that we want to hear from you. So offer your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. It's located beneath the video player. We will also be recording today's discussion, so if you happen to miss any part of it, you can go to agripulse.com and watch the video later on. I'd also like to thank our program sponsors, the National Milk Producers Federation and the U.S. Dairy Export Council, whose support has made this webinar possible. So at this time, I'm excited to announce the first of our two panels for today's program, featuring key players in the farm to fork supply chain. Serving as moderator is Jaime Casaneda, who is Executive Vice President of Policy Development and Strategy for the National Milk Producers Federation. He also leads National Milk's close partnership with the U.S. Dairy Export Council, and in this capacity, he serves as a private sector advisor to the U.S. Trade Representative and to USDA, providing guidance to the administration. Our first panelist, next to the uh, Jaime, is Mike Durkin, President and CEO of Laprino Foods Company, a U.S. Dairy Export Council member. Since joining Laprino Foods in 2011, he has helped shape company strategy and led significant changes in employee engagement. Durkin is a board member of the Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy. He also serves on the International Dairy Food Association's Executive Committee and is a member of the Global Dairy Platform Board of Directors. Welcome, Mike. Joining us virtually is Andrew Wan, Manager of Maritime Business Development and International Marketing at the hot seat for all of our discussions, the Port of Oakland. He leads a team responsible for the Seaport's marketing, business development, and customer relations functions. And prior to joining the Port of Oakland, he spent over 25 years in international logistics on both the shipper and provider sides. And rounding out this table to my far left is Jonathan Eisen, director of the American Trucking Association's Intermodal Motor Carriers Conference. The conference represents the subset of ATA members who operate at the nation's ports and inland intermodal facilities. In this position, Eisen leads the advocacy efforts on issues of concerns to these members, such as supply chain, infrastructure, workplace, and other issues critical to strengthening those connections between ports, highways, and railroads. So now I'd like to turn it over to Jaime for the first panel. 
Thank you so much, Sarah, and welcome, everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure to be able to be here with such a distinguished uh, guest and, and everybody who has been registered. I know that you want to jump right into uh, the issues, so I'm going to ask Mike to go ahead and give us uh, a perspective from Leprino yeah. Foods. Yeah, first of all, thank you, uh, Jaime, and first, uh, thanks to the National Press Club, plus uh, National Milk and AgriPulse for, for having this, and more importantly, U.S. DEC for highlighting this really important issue. Maybe just a little bit of background on Leprino Foods. So we're uh, a privately held family-owned business based in Denver, Colorado. We've got nine plants across the country, as well as kind of two JVs of, uh, worldwide. We also are one of the largest, or actually single largest buyer of milk in the United States and actually the world's largest uh, seller and maker of mozzarella cheese, as well as one of the world's largest sellers of uh, whey products across the country. So with all that comes a lot of exports as well. So with, I'm glad we're here talking, uh, talking about that. We export 26% of our solids in the United States. 16% is actually uh, the U.S. average out there in terms of what happens from a total milk solids in the country. So we are large from that standpoint. Uh, export to 55 countries. So the export business is a huge uh, deal for Leprino Foods, very, very important component of our business, and not just us, but really why we're here uh, is really talking about agricultural products in general, and obviously we're bigger focused on dairy. Um, but just to give some perspective on this, um, we export to a lot of, we use a lot of different, as I said, 55 countries. We go to a lot of ports across the U.S. California is predominantly where we are. Oakland, Long Beach, Oakland is probably the biggest. We go to L.A., Long Beach as well. But if you were to look at this, probably the single biggest factor I can point to is over 90 plus percent of our order, export orders were rolled or missed in 2021. On a normal year, that would have been 10 percent. So that just gives you a perspective. Well over 100 orders were actually rolled um, 17 times, and we had orders that back to order almost five months, and actually had to air freight product to some customers, either we paid or our customers paid, so that we wouldn't run our products out of, our customers wouldn't be able to run out of products to be able to produce their product. This is a big deal. Um, it's not just for Leprino Foods, for the dairy industry, and I know for agricultural products in general. So this issue has to be addressed. Um, I'm extremely pleased. Uh, there's been a lot of Things that have happened, I know we, I personally testified in front of the House Ag Committee back in November. We've got the Ocean Shipping Reform Act uh, got to move along. Obviously, we talked about that, that that passed in December, and I know it sits in, in the Senate at this point in time. Um, but the issue is not going away. Actually, if you were to look at the last nine months, December was the worst month on record. So we're well into a year of this in terms of the shipping crisis. And I know we had a lot of focus on imports. But exports is really where I think we need to put our attention today to be able to solve this problem. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, and now, uh, Andrew, can you hear us? I can. Oh, fantastic. And I hope that actually you have a wonderful day and, and all is well in the West Coast. Um, at least one of your two teams won yesterday. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> and, um, and I hope that actually you're uh, if you're in your office, that you're looking at ag containers being loaded uh, uh, as we speak. Um, I want to thank you and thank the uh, Port of Auckland for their partnership with our organizations um, and obviously with USDA. We, we, are, we certainly continue to announce that we're expanding that partnership and we're going to work closely with our members like Leprino Foods in trying to, to, to do more to try to alleviate that uh, restrictions or constraints. Uh, please give us uh, the perspective of, of Port, Port of Oakland, uh, especially with the announcement of USDA. Yeah, so uh, thank you everybody. Thank you for inviting me this morning. Um, you know, the Port of Oakland recognizes that the, the difficulties the US exporters have been facing, particularly over the last uh, year or so um, in getting the products around uh, the world. And this difficulty is definitely creating uh, long-term market share loss for U.S. products. And I think that's very important for everyone to recognize is the, the potential permanent loss of market share around the world. We've been working with our partners to try and overcome these situations um, with some mild success. And we're actually uh, very excited about the, uh, the upcoming program that we are putting together um, in conjunction with uh, local, state, and federal agencies. Um, there are other programs here at the port that we're also trying to implement to, uh, 
to try and alleviate some of the situations. For a couple of years now, we have had a um, freight intelligent transportation system uh, program that we have been trying to implement here in the port, which is going to um, merge uh, 15 technologies that will be used to monitor and manage traffic in the uh, port area. And it's set to go live in Q3 of 2022. Um, in addition to, um, to the SPITS, we're also working on other visibility tools uh, here at the port to be able to um, uh, provide more information to the users of the port. Um, additionally, here at the port, we're also looking to build for the future um, with the US Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, we are looking to widen um, our turning basin so we can handle the next generation of vessels. Uh, our terminal partners have invested in larger cranes to also be able to handle those vessels as well. And um, the other thing too is this uh, growth res with responsibility. So uh, through uh, uh, public funding programs uh, and, uh, and also with our partners, we are looking to uh, put in zero emissions uh, trucks here in the port, as well as uh, putting in hybrid uh, terminal equipment which will reduce uh, emissions by 95%. So those are some of the things here at the port that we are working on, but specific to the uh, plight of the exporters, you know, we've been working very diligently over the past few months to try and figure out uh, several uh, uh, resolutions to these problems. And slowly, one by one, we hope to be able to uh, successfully tackle this problem. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, last but not uh, less important, uh, in fact, it, it's interesting because a lot of our members uh, started all uh, with significant focus on, on the ports and the carriers, and, and certainly uh, that, is, that is something that it's a priority for us. But that doesn't mean that actually the rest of the supply chain side is not also a very important. And so with uh, an area that it is extremely important, which is tracking and transportation. Uh, John, would you give us your uh, few minutes of, of insight? Sure, and thanks, Jaime. Appreciate the opportunity, and thanks, everybody, for having me today. Um, let me give you a, a few little statistics on trucking in the industry. Um, we are about an $800 billion industry. We uh, deliver about 74% uh, of the freight in this country. Um, and employ uh, about 8 million people um, all, across the country. Obviously, from our perspective, imports and exports are both equally important. We, we support both of them um, and, need, and, and encourage all of both, both things, um, need more imports and need more exports as well. Um, as we kind of look at the world, we see um, that right now the challenges we're facing aren't exactly new. Um, these aren't new issues that our members are all of a sudden facing. These are things that are being exacerbated um, that have been in place for many years that are being exacerbated by um, the workforce issues we're seeing um, with COVID and certainly the volume. Um, but these are things that have been in place for a while. We've been able to muddle through with, with them in place, but, but now we are seeing them much more acutely um, as we look at the world today. Um, from the trucking perspective, I kind of look at three different kind of areas, that, the general buckets that we see as, as our, our, our key challenges. Um, the first being workforce, and that would be both within trucking and within our partners as well um, in, in warehousing distribution and across the economy. Obviously, um, we're seeing what's happening with employment throughout the economy that, that businesses through all sectors are having difficulty finding uh, people right now. Um, that's long been true for uh, warehousing and, and distribution and trucking as well, that that's always been a challenge for all of us. Um, it is more difficult now, uh, unsurprisingly, and that has ramifications uh, for trucking. Uh, if, they're if, if truckers are waiting longer at warehouses to get uh, unloaded or loaded, uh, if, they are, if it is taking a warehouse longer to unload a container, that container is still sitting on a chassis, um, all of those issues create problems. And obviously the driver shortage has been discussed, and I know you all have heard much about that over the years. Um, that's, a, again, a long-term problem, one we've seen that's been in place for many, many years, but is now uh, exacerbated by the, the pandemic. I think prior, I think our last figures were in 2019, we were at about 60,000 drivers short. Now we're at 80,000 drivers short. Um, and obviously that has ramifications all through the supply chain. Um, for the most part, different sectors have different issues with um, 
with the driver shortage, it, it certainly is more acute in, uh, in the long haul sector, but that means that the warehouses uh, next to the ports have trouble getting their product on to the next step. Um, so it all kind of has an accordion effect all, all through the process. Um, the next issue we can look at is equipment and chassis, and I, that's, that's certainly a, a key issue for us. Chassis provisioning is a long-standing issue. Some ports have done it traditionally better than others, uh, but right now across the country, um, at just about every port we're, we're working, on, working with, which is all the ports, and at the inland intermodal facilities, um, chassis are in very, very short supply. That's for a wide variety of reasons. Again, the, the, the ability to move equipment, uh, get it uh, back from warehouses that are a little bit slower uh, in unloading containers. Ex uh, yards are full of empties, so we can't always return empties, and those empties are sitting in motor carrier yards on top of chassis, things like that. And then the tariff that was put on Chinese chassis last year, um, imported chassis from China, has meant that right now it's pretty difficult to buy chassis across the country. So. Um, the supply is very limited and that's a very tight issue. And then finally, um, the information and data sharing issue. Um, right now, we, information is not, not shared well across the supply chain. Mike mentioned blank sailings, those, th those types of things. We don't always get notice of well in advance. It makes it much more difficult to manage our supply chain, to manage equipment, to manage people. Um, and so hopefully improving um, that information sharing and data will be something that we're, we do significantly as we come out of this. So, thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much, uh, John. Uh, let me start um, uh, with some questions, but please uh, be prepared. Uh, we're gonna have been monitoring questions from uh, uh, online from the audience, but also uh, those of you who are here uh, can ask uh, questions and there will be a, a mic uh, going around. Uh, Mike, actually, let me, let me ask you a question that I'm going to also uh, change slightly for everybody, but as, as, as that question too. Uh, first of all, for you, what, what, is, what, is, what are the really long-term consequences if we don't fix this uh, anytime soon? And, and to help you answer that question is if you were keen of the, <laughs> of the day, yeah. Uh, what are the two, three things that you would actually be asking to, to be changed? Yeah, and I think uh, Andrew actually mentioned that probably our, our biggest concern uh, from an international standpoint is do we, our customers look for reliability and consistency of supply? And I wouldn't think they'd be any different from a domestic standpoint, but an inability to get our products um, on a ship in, into a country or into an, to our customers reliability, consistently, at a fair price, all those things happen, and uh, our concern is the long-term viability of the international market for dairy, the dairy industry. And not just that, but, but, but you know, for agricultural products in general. So, and listen, Andrew we, was on a different, another panel with me not that long ago, and I uh, applaud Andrew and the team and, and for his help and how they're trying to think uh, creatively, and, and the, obviously the announcement from Secretary Vilsack on the USDA plan in conjunction with the Port of Oakland. So. We think we need creative thinking like that um, to be able to kind of to solve this, and it's 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 really important. But maybe a couple things I'll get to, and then I'll move to maybe some of the solutions that I know we want to talk about. If you were to look at it, and this is a direct quote from one of our carriers: anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of bookings are ghost bookings, meaning multiple companies are booking multiple times because they do not know whether that that shipment will get on a boat. So think about that; it's hard to coordinate. Throw that on top of a chassis, uh, equipment, labor shortage, and if you have a quick notice to turn around and say, hey, we've got an opening, you, you now can't get the product there because you don't have enough time. So I think there's an opportunity for information sharing to be able to kind of hopefully be a bit more transparency, I think, to avoid some of that, and I think the carriers as well as company shipping could help, help with that. 70% of the containers going back on a ship are empty. That used to be around 30. We know the export-import imbalance, so it's somewhat understood. But how we let 70% go back and what's changed, we need to alter that. And I think there's some plans I know the Secretary does as well, the Biden administration, to be able to avoid that, that happening going forward. I look at it in a kind of a three-pong thing. There needs to be a short-term, medium-term, and a long-term solution. Long-term, we have the infrastructure bill. Great, we really appreciate the Biden administration and Secretary as well for putting that out there. But that clearly is a long-term. It's not gonna be anything there to help fix some of the port infrastructure challenges. 
But if you really focus on the, on the medium term, we've got a couple of suggestions out there. Obviously, the, the Port of Oakland plan that we have, I think, is really good. We propose at Loprino Foods a fast lane approach. So think about you're at Disney World, you buy the fast pass, you actually go to the front of the line. If you actually agree to go back full and have full products and hopefully ag products that, that, are, that are part of that part of that deal. Obviously, we need to solve the equipment issue, but we also, you know, when you think about empties plus ghost bookings, those are things that can be done immediately. The Ocean Shipping Reform Act, passed the Senate quickly, as I talked about, or, or, or our House earlier in December, we need to get that passed in front of the Senate to be able to address some of these other issues, I think. We have, have been having conversations, and you know, thanks to USDEC and, and as well as USDA, in particular the Secretary, for bringing together an IDFA, um, some of the carriers. And we've been having conversations with the carriers, and plans are, you're starting to see the wheels start to turn to be able to start to solve some of these issues. But that's what it's gonna take. It is a fully integrated process. If we have a booking and all that's there and our product's ready to go, but if we don't have equipment or a driver to get it there, that it's, not, it's all for nothing. So this is not one small thing. It does have to be fully integrated. And John talked about the information sharing and transparency, I think, is the other piece that's gonna have to happen. It's uh, excellent. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that everybody's taking notes of, of, of that. Um, Andrew, let me uh, ask you the same question about whether you were king of the world today and two or three items that you would actually have the power to change. But I want you to insert there uh, the relationship between carriers and shippers. I mean, what can you tell us? I mean, how we can improve that? Yeah, so thank you. Um, you know, I'd like to reference what Mike just said about the, uh, the ghost bookings. So I think as we move forward, um, there will become a new dynamic with regards to how shippers and carriers will contract as they move into the future. Um, I think one of the most important things that this supply chain conundrum has forced is the visibility of logistics up into the sea level. Um, in, in many organizations in the past, it was just a pass through and you just uh, did it for as cheaply as you could. But I do think that this has now brought um, logistics to the forefront. So just a couple of things with respect to how I, I see the relationship working um, between shippers and carriers moving forward. I think first is um, enforceable contracts. Uh, in the past, contracts had um, penalties, but none of them were ever enforceable, uh, just due to market conditions and market fears. Um, I think moving forward, uh, carriers and shippers will be able to speak specifically to the, the needs of each party and to try and build a program that works for both parties, um, which means that um, if it's positioning equipment in very difficult areas and the carrier happens to maybe have um, import business coming into that area. So the carriers and the shippers can work to very much target the level of services that uh, they each need. And I think the last piece is that um, as opposed to looking at um, uh, ocean shipping as a uh, one piece of a supply chain, I think this will force uh, parties to really view the all in costs of getting product from origin to destination. In the past, there's been a habit to break down the trucking leg, the ocean leg. Um, and now I think that uh, what it's forcing everyone to do is what is the all in cost? If I spend a lot more on ocean freight, but I can save on, on the drayage or I can save on time or the carrying cost of money, um, what does that really look like in the, in, in the whole? In the whole? Um, and I think that that is what's gonna force um, shippers and carriers to really evaluate as they move forward. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. John, uh, so uh, it's not that I know lots about the trucking industry, but I do know because I hear it all the time and we have some legislation and we're trying um, a national milk producer side, uh, trying to change some rules on the, on the trucking side. But we know that actually Canada and Europe can do certain things that we cannot do uh, here that make us less efficient. Uh, what is it that those, those type of things, like if you king of the, the world, what would you um, ask to be changed, whether it's at the state level or at the national level, to make us more efficient that, that actually 
Uh, drivers don't have to wait that long. Uh, what, what are the kind of things that actually uh, the boxes or, or the wait limit? Well, I, I think, first of all, the answers we've heard both from Mike and Andrew are, are, are really right on, on point, it is that the information and understanding uh, of, what, of how best to utilize people and assets um, is really the, 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 the first step in the process, understanding exactly um, what's coming in, where it will be coming in, when, sh when ships are going to, to, to not call at a particular point, um, so that we can operate our, our systems more efficiently. In trucking, efficiency is really the name of the game. Um, we have to utilize our limited resources, people's time, and our equipment as efficiently and effectively as possible. So, you know, waiting in line at ports takes that driver uh, out of the uh, out of the queue. It, it, he, that time is is lost. We have, uh, you know, drivers are limited in their hours of service. If they spend time waiting at a port, that's time there that they will no longer be able to work. Um, they can't recover. That that's you can't make that up. So that type of efficiency and and, and data sharing and understanding of exactly what's happening at a port is really, is really pretty critical. Um, and there are also you know, all kinds of rules in place um, that, that make efficiency more, more difficult. Box rules is an example uh, in a port requiring that uh, a particular uh, ocean shipping line, containers from a particular ocean shipping line be picked up with a chassis from a particular uh, intermodal equipment provider, you know, where a, a trucker may have a different chassis on his truck. He's got to go then get the proper chassis in order to go pick up the container he's supposed to pick up. Um, those types of, you know, difficult small um, issues really make efficiency that much more difficult. Um, and I think bringing all the parties together and focus on operating efficiently and effectively is really the single biggest thing um, that's most important. Uh, if I could do it all in a day, one day. Yeah, I mean, I think that if we collectively put all these ideas together, I think that um, the administration, the ports, the governors uh, can, can certainly take, take actions that perhaps not be a silver bullet each one, but it certainly uh, would have help uh, all of us in the short, short term. I think we have a question online. A question here from Michael Simonanis from the Louis Dreyfus Company. This is mostly directed toward Andrew, uh, but open to the entire panel. It has been well documented that ocean carriers are lifting a higher percentage of empty containers each week compared to pre-pandemic levels, and as a percentage of higher vo overall volumes. Therefore, how does the proposed landside investment assist practically when there is a de facto cap on export containers per vessel each week? Hi, Mike. Uh, thanks for your question and good to hear from you. Um, you know, as a port authority, we can only control what we can control. And we do uh, believe that uh, there are, uh, the terminals are congested, uh, partially because there are a lot of empties sitting on the terminals uh, waiting to get re-exported back out to Asia. Uh, this is causing uh, congestion um, on the terminal and inability for empties to be returned. The facility that we are proposing um, will actually and effectively expand the size of the terminal and allow those empties to come in and free up chassis. So what we are doing here is to give the exporter the ability to pick up empty containers when they need to um, in a quicker fashion so they can load. Um, as as cutoffs uh, from the ocean carriers uh, move and also the, uh, the windows for receiving get compressed, uh, I think one of the things that we're trying to do is just create velocity for the exporters to be able to get as much cargo as they can into the terminal uh, during those open periods. And that really, at the end of the day, is the ultimate goal. Uh, we do hope that the, the carriers will continue to take as much export-laden cargo as they can to help the US exporters. Thank you, Andrew. Any other question? questions from the audience here? Bill? Let me on, wait, uh, yeah, for the mic. Uh. Oh, okay, yeah, no, that's fine, thank you. <laughs> uh, FFMC chairman said, I think in a recent hearing that he didn't really have the authority to make the carriers stop canceling bookings and taking back the empties. 
uh, which I'm wondering, is there any executive power that could be wielded to do this, or does everything hang on OSRA, on, on the legislation, to, you know, make these carriers deliver what they said they're going to deliver and load up their dairy and hay and almonds and... Well, I think there's a... Well, go ahead. Please, <laughs> please, in. go ahead. I think, to your point, I think there's a, a reality here, and actually I just talked about this with Secretary Vilsack on a panel discussion we were an agricultural panel discussion we had the other day. And I think there actually needs to be, so granted, there is no authority directly. Those carriers are independent companies and or owned by, by state, state government, in this case countries, however that might be set up. So, but I do think there's an opportunity through, um, if they, obviously, the U.S. is a huge importer of goods and exporter, despite the challenges that we're having done in a profitable market for the carrier. So I think there is some incentive that we can do to try to generate that if from it, whether it's tax or other different things, that if in fact this does not get done, you know, do, are there some limitations that require from a, from a US market access standpoint? So I think there's an opportunity. What we did propose, and I, I suggested to the secretary was, there really isn't, I know we have Mr. Procarius here and I appreciate that in the White House, but is there some, whether it's FMC, Secretary of Transportation, commerce, whoever, where specifically the port is focused that there is authority granted to that agency to have some more direct control over what happens. Today, it feels like it's very disparate and not really in a direct control. So that was one of the suggestions that, that we had. The Ocean Shipping Reform Act is there. But I do believe there's pressure and other things that can be done from the White House uh, and, I, and we, I believe that, uh, and the administration uh, to be able to kind of get this ship righted, so to speak. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, Andrew, John, you want to? No? Okay. Uh, but I, I, I couldn't agree more with Mike. I, I think that that legislation is essential, uh, is critical, but, but also I think that there is a number of things that can be uh, also done. Uh, we have another question here from the audience. Uh, can you uh, introduce yourself? And... Hi, thank you so much. Scotty Greenwood, Canadian American Business Council. Um, excellent discussion. I've, speaking of exporters and importers, this isn't a port, a seaport question, but a land port question. Uh, when we think about trucking, we know that $700 billion a year uh, is the economic relationship U.S. and Canada, biggest in the world by a lot. For the gentleman from trucking, there's been some trucking news in Ottawa uh, prompted by vaccine mandates for truckers coming back and forth across. I wonder do you worry about the supply chain uh, for the U.S. and Canada uh, with, with these new mandates, both from Canada and the U.S. on truckers? And for the gentleman from Denver, I don't, you're in the dairy business. Uh, Canada has a protected market. I wonder, I don't know how much of your business is up there, but I'd be interested, uh, if any at all. Thanks. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, there's no question that the, the vaccine mandates between the United States and Canada right now are creating uh, difficulty. Um, you know, workforce issues, I, I mentioned in my, in my opening, workforce issues are critical when you're taking individuals out of the workforce or, or making it so that they cannot cross the border um, because of their vaccine status. Obviously, that, that makes it much more difficult um, for trade to happen. So. Um, it, it, there's no question that, that we're seeing um, the impact of, of the mandate right now between the two countries. So, um, yes, reduced, reducing trade is, is not something we're in favor of. And in our standpoint, we have very little going into Canada. Obviously, the, the dairy is a pretty protected industry in Canada, so the reality is we don't ship any our cheese products do not go in because the tariffs are so high that we can't talk. So I know we talk about the trade agreements in there, but uh, dairy, the dairy back and forth is fairly challenged, so. Another question? Uh, and I was going to say, yeah, uh, certainly, e even today with USMCA, we're, we're still struggling a little bit on, on yeah. getting what we got uh, in Canada. Okay, sure. So go okay. ahead, please. Uh, Mike Dorning from Bloomberg. So just sort of pulling out at the 30,000 foot level, What's broken about the market for shipping across oceans? Because I look at the shipping company's earnings, and if you're a shipping company, there's nothing wrong. They're making 
-hmm. record, record profits. I see them come over the ticker with super earnings. Yep. So if you own shipping companies, I think everything must be going great. Um, why is the market broken? Why can't like normal market forces work this out? And if you put your you know, hand on the scale the way you folks want to, what will be the additional cost for imports? Do you have any sense? Is that going to make imports more expensive or slower? Do you have any sense of what the trade-off is here? Yeah, no, thanks for Just that like question. Point, yeah. Mike, you, you and I will ask uh, Andrew. Andrew and John, but, but Mike, you. Well, clearly, we, we know that the carriers, we see the information, too. So we know they're, they're making a lot of money. Um, listen, I want to, we've had a number of conversations, again, USDEC, IDFA, um, as well as I like a call out to, I know Andrew I talked about before, and I want to thank him, as I said, but also Gene Soroka, who heads up the LA port. And through those individuals, we've actually had individual conversations with the, with the individual car group discussions with the individual carriers out there. So they are coming to the table, um, starting to see it. The question's going to be, are the solutions um, real, tangible, and, and, and I talked about short term. We need, we need to see the impact here in the next six to 12 months. So I, I think they're coming to the table. They're offering a number of, of suggestions, and, and there's a couple things in particular that I can that I, I, I don't want to call it out individually. We're still working through some things on this, but uh, I feel like we're get, starting to get some, get some traction. I, I, I go back to some of my what would be my answer, part of my answer earlier. I do think there's a, there's some things that we can, we can do on a national level, whether that's the Ocean Shipping Reform Act, as well as kind of pressure from the administration and the secretary talking about. The importance not only of, of, listen, we've got a significant imbalance. We always talk about that, the, the trade imbalance. This is something that should be have bipartisan support to help solve from an export standpoint, particularly agriculture. Uh, our concern is you know, the reliability and, and the cost effectiveness of our product will roll back eventually to the farm level. And we know how important that, important that is. So, um, and I do think there, there are solutions that are out there that will eventually try to solve this. It's going to take a little bit of time. The reality is COVID hit. You have a backlog of things. And to try, our infrastructure was never that great anyway. And then you turn around to then turn around and suddenly solve that issue um, overnight wasn't going to happen. So I do think there's some short-term things the industry is working on with the carriers, with the administration, uh, with all the folks kind of USDEC and a few others that will hopefully over time start to see this thing go. But I do think there's long-term reform that's going to be required uh, to do this as well. John, and uh, I think you know, from our perspective, you know, I, I think that points out the imbalance in the system right now. American exporters are struggling. Importers are having difficulty getting their product into the country, um, and yet ocean carriers are making money um, in extraordinary amounts. Um, that, to my, in our view, that kind of points out the need for legislation like the Ocean Shipping Reform Act um, at its most basic uh, level. Um, there's clearly an imbalance going on right now, and, and, and so there's uh, additional legislation and regulation that's needed there um, to make sure that the, the, the system does the balance out. Thanks. Thank you. Andrew, I don't know if you went last uh, word. We, we ran out of minutes uh, here, but... Sure, sure. No, I thank you for the last opportunity. Uh, you know, being a part authority, I, I want to try and give a balanced uh, answer as I can. Um, I, I think what this conundrum has really brought light to is some of the systematic issues that have actually existed in our logistics supply chain for a long time. And I think that uh, what we're seeing today is uh, just a result of what the problems have been from probably the last decade. And hopefully through this situation, we can actually fix those long-term uh, structural issues that we have seen in the supply chain and build something better as we move forward. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, again, thanks, everybody. I just want to add that, um, yes, I have seen that uh, people in, in, in the carrier side are saying that actually all, all these companies are exporting in large quantities. Uh, what it is not talk is at what cost and what is it that it is lost opportunity for additional exports. So there is a lot behind that story that I'm sure that Mike and others, uh, because this is not just about dairy. We have a number of other um, 
companies, organizations uh, in the fruits and vegetables, meat side, that are actually equally impacted. Uh, so, so all of us are, are in the same uh, coalition. Uh, please uh, help us thank our panel, and I'm gonna actually um, call the, our next panel, which is moderated by Krista Hardin, uh, and uh, she's the president and CEO of the U.S. Dairy Expert Council. She previously served as Chief Sustainability Officer with Corteva and DuPont. Uh, Ms. Harden also spent seven years working at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. She served an, as, as an Assistant Secretary for Congressional Relations, Chief of Staff of U.S. Agricultural Secretary Tom Bilsack, and also uh, Deputy Secretary. So I welcome her uh, on the stage to introduce our next speakers, and also she's my boss. <laughs> In here. I'm going to give very, very brief introductions because I know that we want to get right to the topics of the day. You heard the last folks kind of tee up what's going on, um, so we're going to talk about some solutions. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Secretary Vilsack, but I have worked for him directly in four different positions, <laughs> so I know he does not want an introduction, and I also know he really does not need one. So I'll uh, just say welcome and thank you, sir. One thing I will say about you and all my positions, you're not about identifying the problem, you're about finding solutions and answers. Oh, thank you. And I think that just sums it up on why you're here today, and we'll look forward to hearing from you. Next to him is um, John Bakari. We're so excited that you're with us, Mr. Bakari. He is the port, port envoy for the Biden-Harris administration on supply chain disruptions. And it's a task force that you're leading, I believe. Thank you for that. He is a former deputy of the Department of Transportation, so he's very well prepared for these kinds of issues. And we're very honored and appreciate you taking the time to be here in person, so thank you. Um, and joined um, virtually by two very important members of Congress who've been really good friends to agriculture and have really taken the issues that have been discussed already. And we're gonna dig even deeper into um, so we really appreciate them both taking their time today. John Giramondi from California's 3rd District. He's on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Thank you, sir. And we're also joined by Congressman um, Dusty Johnson of South Dakota, um, a recognized leader on rural issues and a um, member of the Ag Committee. They came together in a bipartisan way, introduced, um, let me get this, the exact name of this, the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2021, bipartisan legislation. Um, really appreciate the efforts that both of you have made um, to look for solutions to some of the issues we're talking about. So um, with that, that's our panel. We're excited to have everyone and appreciate their time. With that, Mr. Secretary, I'm gonna let you start and um, give us a little overview of what you're up to. Well, uh, Krista, thanks very much. And this is, an, John, this is a very important meeting because for all these years, I thought I was working for Krista. So now I find out that uh, it's not the, it's the other way around. So it's great to be with her and appreciate her leadership of the uh, U.S. Dairy Export Council. And John, let me just say in front of all these folks, really appreciate uh, the work that you're doing on a very difficult set of issues with reference to our ports. You have been incredibly available whenever I've uh, had to call a moment's notice uh, and really appreciate the partnership uh, with what we're going to announce today. So really, thank you very much for your leadership. And to the two members of Congress, thank you very much for putting the spotlight on this issue uh, with your uh, Ocean Shipping Reform Act. I think it really does crystallize uh, the important role that we need to play as policymakers. Uh, and I think you uh, recognize the problem and certainly appreciate your, your leadership and hope that uh, uh, this gets, uh, this gets a good hearing in, in Congress. Look, in December of uh, 2021, Secretary Buttigieg and I uh, sent a letter uh, to ocean carriers uh, who service the U.S., urging those ocean carriers uh, to help mitigate the disruption that was taking place uh, in agricultural exports uh, by restoring reciprocal treatment uh, of imports and exports and improving service. And I will say that uh, I see Michael Durkin is here today, and, and he has also taken an incredible leadership position uh, on this issue for the dairy industry and for agriculture generally. Um, and he, he essentially suggested there was a need for reciprocity, and uh, he's certainly right. Uh, we know that a uh, few containers uh, are, are available. Uh, our, our 
agricultural companies are seeing uh, significant charges uh, assessed uh, to them, uh, incredibly high fees that they have to pay. Uh, and the, what, what pains them most of all, I think, is the fact that they see a lot of empty containers leaving our ports, headed to markets uh, that should be filled with agricultural products. And, and you know, this got to the point where in Oakland, uh, there was a suspension of activity on the part of many of these carriers. And that's the reason why Secretary Buttigieg and I sent the letter. It's important to agriculture because at any given year, 20 to 30 percent of what we grow and raise in this country is exported. And it absolutely impacts and affects the bottom line of agriculture, uh, of producers. Uh, in most cases, it's 20, uh, or in some cases, more than 20 percent of the net income that is experienced by farmers, ranchers, and producers. And certainly there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of jobs that are connected directly to agricultural exports. Uh, and so it's important for us to resolve uh, the, the disruptions that are occurring. Um, we identified early in the administration resources under the Commodity Credit Corporation, which we felt could justifiably be used to try to address some of the issues, especially as it relates to empty containers. Uh, and so today we're announcing a partnership uh, with John Bakari's assistance and help, uh, as well as Secretary Buttigieg's help at the Department of Transportation, a partnership between the USDA, the Department of Transportation, uh, the Port Envoy, and the Port of Oakland. And the goal of this is essentially to get uh, a quicker pickup of empty containers, uh, provide access uh, so those containers can be filled with agricultural products, avoid the congestion that often occurs in the ports, and hopefully avoid surcharges and additional fees, and in fact, hopefully see many of those empty containers filled with agricultural products. Here's how it's going to work. Uh, the Port of Oakland is going to make available a 25-acre site uh, where ag companies can use this site to fill empty uh, containers uh, with American agricultural uh, commodities. We hope to have this operational uh, as soon as early March. Uh, USDA is going to pay 60% of the cost of the startup of this particular uh, effort. Uh, the Port of Oakland will provide the space. Uh, containers will be made available to ag companies and cooperatives. Uh, they will fill them up with commodities. There will be a dedicated gate uh, with the ability to pre-cool reefer containers so that uh, perishable items can be placed in these containers. The Department of Agriculture will also provide uh, the, uh, the shippers a subsidize uh, for each container of $125 per container uh, to basically uh, offset some of the logistic costs of moving uh, containers here and there. We believe that the combination of the uh, assistance, the subsidy, and the assistance of this uh, location will help us see an expanded export of nuts, uh, dairy, uh, wine, meat, hay, tomatoes, uh, citrus, rice, uh, and soybeans and other agricultural products, particularly those uh, that are uh, being produced on the West Coast. We're excited about this, and we think it will service Asian markets Seven out of the 10 top markets for agri American agriculture are in Asia. So it's incredibly important that we do this. One final comment. Here's why it's important to companies like uh, Laprino Cheese. They have established over the course of many, many years, as have all of American uh, commodity groups, the ability to deliver safe, available, uh, ample supply of American products in these Asian markets on a very predictable and reliable basis. And when there is this dis disruption that they're currently facing, it makes it more difficult for them to maintain that market reputation. And with that market reputation, you also risk the loss of market share. And once you lose market share in these competitive uh, circumstances, it is very difficult to get it back. So it's important for us to start this pilot effort in the Port of Oakland the hope and the goal is that we're able to expand this opportunity in other ports along the coast, uh, in the hope that eventually we see a, a more free-flowing uh, effort on, uh, on the export side. A lot of attention in this port issue has been paid to imports, and rightfully so. But with this announcement, we hope to be able to make sure that people understand this isn't just an import issue, it's also an export issue. Uh, and the Department of Agriculture wants to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. So thank you, Christine. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. That's very exciting. I know there will be questions with from our audiences, both in the room and um, online, about the details. But that's exciting. That is positive. 
Mr. Pocari, um, thank you so much for leading this task force, for being a part of this. As the Secretary said, you've been so available um, to all of us to talk about these issues. We'd love some, some comments from you as well. Thank you. It's, it's my pleasure, and uh, thank you all for having me here today. Uh, this is one group I don't need to tell about uh, the glo global di dislocations in the supply chains. You're living it every day. And as Secretary Vilsack said, while the focus is often on imports, on uh, products coming to America, we need to have an equal focus on exports as well. They're crucial to our economy. And we've been focused like a laser, uh, all of us, on agricultural exports since these supply chain disruptions began. Uh, as you all know, we're the world's largest agricultural exporter. Uh, we had a record year, looking forward to another record year, uh, but uh, there's much more that we can do. At the same time, uh, as we had this record year, California ports had a 9% drop in containerized agricultural exports between May and September of 2021. Uh, and that 9% average was a 15% drop at the Port of Long Beach, an 18% drop at the Port of Los Angeles, and a staggering 34% drop at the Port of Oakland. Uh, and as you all know, Oakland's historically been one of our nation's strongest agricultural exporting ports. Uh, that translates into $2.1 billion in lost California agricultural exports over the same time period uh, from the state of California alone. Uh, it's had a nationwide impact as well, obviously. So why is this happening? Uh, one, uh, because of the economics of containers right now uh, exporting an empty container is simply uh, more valuable to ocean carriers than a container filled with agricultural products right now. Uh, the, the price of a filled export container is, went from $650 to $1,000 over the last year. While going the other way, the price of a container uh, for import went from $4,300 to $13,600. So you can see uh, the driving economics that are working against U.S. agricultural exports. Uh, the, the second reason uh, is the record-setting volumes in container traffic uh, that the pandemic brought. Uh, we uh, shifted our spending from restaurants and theaters to buying goods and imported goods for the most part. That means uh, an unprecedented shortage of chassis, containers, truckers, uh, and the entire ecosystem uh, that, that serves trade. The third reason, and Secretary Vilsack mentioned this, is the loss of ocean carrier service. They're concentrating on fewer ports uh, and the most lucrative service. That's particularly acute at the Port of Oakland, which lost some Far East and Southeast Asian service uh, that we hope to bring back. So we're attacking the problem from both ends, uh, finding ways to incentivize and streamline agricultural exports and working with these ocean carriers to restore service. So the announcement that you heard today for the Port of Oakland uh, is only one part of a multi-pronged strategy. Uh, think of it as first firing a warning shot across the bow of ocean carriers uh, that we are watching uh, and, uh, and responding uh, on agricultural exports. It's important to our nation. The promotion of U.S. exports is a core part of the Federal Maritime Commission's mission, uh, and, and we urge the Federal Maritime Commission uh, to honor that. Restoring critical Southeast Asian and Far East service in general is, uh, at ports uh, like Oakland, uh, is important as well. So that's another part of the strategy. Uh, the partnership that brought this deal here today is not done. Now we need to work on making sure the service is there for the U.S. Uh, agricultural needs. Uh, one of the ways that we're doing that around the country is establishing pop-up sites, uh, this one in Oakland, We've previously announced uh, uh, multiple sites in Georgia, more to follow. These help both imports and exports. And for agricultural exports, some of these pop-up sites in Georgia, for example, are hundreds of miles uh, closer to the point of origin, making it that much easier uh, to export the goods. So uh, we'll continue to build fluidity at the ports uh, so that exports aren't disadvantaged. Uh, we'll emphasize uh, rail use is part of uh, the way that we can do that. And then finally, I would just mention that uh, in the unprecedented uh, port funding that comes with the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, the Port Infrastructure Development Program grants uh, are 
going to be enabling and encouraging U.S. exports as part of that infrastructure strategy. So we're working this multi-pronged strategy in the short term through daily operational work and in the long term through a port action plan uh, that uh, President Biden and the National Economic Council have previously rolled out. We'll have better data, state freight plans that support the kind of infrastructure projects that help us export, and looking at uh, exporting as a system of systems and making sure that every weak link in that system is worked on. Thanks. That's great. Thank you. Very, very good, positive news. Congressman Garamendi, we'd love to hear from you. I'll be delighted to uh, comment. Mr. Secretary and Mr. Bakari, thank you so very much. Appreciate your presentation. Uh, particularly, uh, Mr. Bakari, we've worked uh, almost 12 years together on the various maritime issues. And so uh, thank you for your knowledge and your uh, expertise on it. Bottom line is, gentlemen, all that you're doing isn't going to solve the problem. The problem is the shippers, the ocean carriers, simply do not understand the word reciprocity. They don't understand that this is a two-way street, in and out. And until they get that message, all of the good things that you're doing is simply not going to solve the problem. The economics are going to drive those ocean carriers to do exactly what they're doing until there is a law that says you can't do it. If you're bringing a container full into the United States and you're going to take a container out that is also full. Otherwise, you're not coming. And for the Port of Oakland, good luck. There's a reason that those carriers are not in the Port of Oakland today. They're not there because they can make more money sitting outside the ports of LA and Long Beach waiting for an empty container that they can then put on their ship back to the West, back to the Western Pacific. There ought to be a law. And by God, we're going to get a law. And we're going to get something in place that provides the necessary tools so that you two gentlemen and others that follow in your footsteps will have the power to make right in this economic situation. There's one thing that our bill doesn't do, and I surely hope that a bill is introduced and hearings take place, and that is to remove the uh, exemption from all of the antitrust laws that the ocean shippers presently have. Now, I'm gonna turn this over to my colleagues who I've had the great pleasure of working with, and he's gonna lay on you what the bill does and how it will work. So, Dusty, I don't know if you, I know you're always prepared, so have at it. Uh, it has been a pleasure to work with John Garamendi. Uh, and I think in part because he and I both realized that uh, this is not a Republican problem or a Democrat problem. It's an American problem. Uh, I thought the secretary and Mr. Picari did a very good job of laying out the complexities as well as some of the things that they've been working on to make this better. And to me, it, it, it's really a three prong issue. I mean, number one, we do need investments in the ports. And uh, even members of Congress who didn't vote for the, the bipartisan infrastructure package for one provision or another, I think really celebrate this investment in the port. So that's number one. Number two, uh, we have, I think, operational adjustments that are being made. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I'm really excited about these pop-up staging areas. And I, I'm even more excited as you talk about, if it works, expanding this. But you know what? Number three is, as exactly as John Garamendi suggested, <laughs> We do need regulatory reform uh, because right now the interests of the uh, ocean carriers are not particularly well aligned to uh, the interests of American shippers. And so John's right, we do need OSRA uh, 2021. Uh, what does it do? Well, at its heart, it, it does demand reciprocity. It does set minimum service standards. It does make it clear that the burden for approving uh, detention and demerge fees are appropriate are gonna be on the carriers that uh, impose them. And I think collectively, these will give the FMC the tools that they need uh, to make this system work better, to make it more efficient and more effective. Now, I'm going to put a pin in all that. And, and I just want to say, because uh, I've talked about how many, I mean, we passed OSTR out of the house. We've got the pop-up staging area coming. We've got investments being made in the port. I think we're only about 40% of the way there. 
We cannot take our foot off the pedal. We have to make sure that we continue to push these things forward. I was talking to the, the dried bean and lentil folks. They told me that still they have 30 or 40% of their uh, shipments being canceled. Uh, that's a new number. That, that is not something from two or five months ago. So we still have a very real problem. And I just wanna humbly, uh, by way of a closing offer in those three areas, those three prongs I mentioned, things that I think we can do uh, to uh, close the gap between where we're at and where we need to be. Uh, number one, uh, with regard to these capital expenses, I think we wanna make sure that as the administration puts out dollars, that they are focused like a laser on improving efficiency and effectiveness, and that we don't get distracted by other agendas and what these dollars can do to maybe further those agendas. Efficiency and effectiveness, number one. Second prong, uh, operational adjustments. Trucking was talked about a lot in the last panel, and I do think February 7th is not the right date uh, to have these new training requirements come into the American trucking industry. I think we should have a, 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 we should have a short term stay so that we can uh, start to, uh, or not start, but we can make sure that uh, we aren't imposing a new barrier on American truck drivers during this supply chain crunch. And the number three, uh, Garamendi and Johnson have gotten all this through the house. <laughs> Let's get it through the Senate. I'm excited for uh, Thune and Klobuchar. They have been talking publicly about doing something. They're building momentum on their side. I think their text is going to be a little different than ours. I would tell you John and Dusty have the stew exactly right because we've worked with so many in industry uh, to get it right. Uh, but, you know, listen, we'll try to bring the Senate around to our perfect way of thinking. But their, their action is, is welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Love the energy and love the passion from both of you. Thank you for the leadership and um, a lot of ideas out there. Mr. Picari, anything you want to react to as we look at the ocean carriers? We know they were at record profits last year. We know this is a very sensitive situation. Any thoughts um, on some of the issues that were raised by the congressman? Well, first, the principle of reciprocity is very important. Uh, we are an exporting nation uh, and uh, it is clear from the data and from the evidence that agricultural exports uh, are being disadvantaged right now. That's unacceptable. So uh, we, we, we do need to move forward. Uh, I would point out that data is maybe one of the unspoken parts of this. The more transparent data we have for every part of the goods movement chain, uh, the better off we are in terms of being able to fix it. Uh, uh, this is an industry that traditionally doesn't share data very much, in direct contrast to, say, the airline industry. Uh, and uh, all, of, all of us would benefit uh, by that data sharing. It would be a more efficient industry, and we'd be able to see around corners a little bit and anticipate the next uh, economic shock, uh, respond to the next natural disaster. All the kinds of things that you know happen to global trade would benefit from more transparent information that is closely guarded and proprietary right now. If, if I might uh, insert something here. Please. Uh, this is John Garamendi. Who owns those ocean carriers? I think we know, don't we, Mr. Picari? Could you lay out the ownership of the five largest that control some 70, 80% of the traffic? Uh, yes, Congressman. So the, the short answer is none of them are American. Uh, so 2% of the uh, global shipping market uh, is US flag okay. vessels. Uh, it's um, uh, France, uh, Italy, uh, Nordic countries, China. No, no. Um, it's- Well, wait a minute. Let's, let's get right to the heart of it. China, Taiwan, Korea. To the West Coast ports, those are the three big shippers. And then Maersk could be the fourth or the fifth. Is that correct? That's correct. So my point, that is correct. Yes, it is correct. My point is this. This is an international trade issue of extraordinary importance to my district, to Dusty's district, and to America. So is the administration putting any pressure on those countries who own or control those shipping lines to make this right for American shippers? Uh, my question to both of you. Two points on that. Uh, uh, first, uh, we've been working directly with those ocean carriers at the C-suite level and to make clear what the nation's objectives are. And two, uh, yes, the Department of State has actually been uh, a critical part, uh, among other agencies, of this discussion. 
And so we've seen over that period of time that they've been involved, they changed from 40% empty to 70% empty returning to the Western Pacific. Not very effective work. Mr. Secretary, you want to make some comments to that? Well, <laughs> there are a couple of things I'd like to respond to the Congressman on. Number one, Congressman, uh, there, there's not any uh, effort here to suggest that what we're proposing with this pop-up is the, the only solution. But I will tell you that it's an important first step. Uh, and I don't think it should be diminished uh, in terms of our ability to try to figure out ways in which we can encourage uh, folks to uh, uh, to understand and appreciate the necessity of, of dealing with this. Number two, we are seeing some of the shippers coming back to the Port of Oakland by virtue of the letter that was sent by Secretary Buttigieg and myself. I think there are now three uh, significant ones that have returned to that port. So I think there is an opportunity there for partnership. Number three, we hope, and we began the conversations with the Port of LA and the Port of Long Beach, that they see the opportunity as well, and we are open uh, to working collectively with them to try to address this issue from the perspective of the USDA. So, I mean, there is an ongoing effort here. Uh, and, you know, under the circumstances, given that ongoing effort, it, we're doing this with limited resources from a standpoint of personnel at the Department of Agriculture, in part, Congressman, because we're operating on a continuing resolution. We don't have a budget yet. So <laughs> you can put pressure on us. I'm going to put pressure right back on you guys. <laughs> Give me a budget. Fair, Give me some people. Fair enough. Krista, can I fair double enough. down on something Mr. Picari said, Krista? Yes, sir, you certainly can. Yeah, I mean, you know, he talked about when we're when our shippers are not able to deliver these agricultural products, it endangers uh, continued market access. And he is exactly right. And that that's what I'm hearing from ag producers. You know, they've got their international partners who are wondering, can we rely on America? And they've been able to rely on us decade in and decade out. We've expanded some of those markets and because, in part because of the big investment that USDA, uh, Secretary Vilsack and his predecessors have made in helping folks establish these international markets. We cannot afford to throw that investment away. Some of them, as I'm sure you all know, are turning toward air freight to try to deliver a product on time. That is not sustainable. These markets are at risk, which is why we've got to close the gap from the 40% that I think we're at to the 100% that's going to deliver us a, a full solution. Thank you. Well yeah, said. It, it, if ahead, I may, the consistency and predictability part, uh, just to build on that, this is not just a West Coast issue. It is most acute in the West Coast ports, uh, but we are seeing and hearing the same thing on the East Coast and the Gulf Coast. The Port of Houston, uh, with agricultural uh, products, just recently went through uh, some, some of the same difficulties. And I would point out there are also industry best practices that can actually help uh, build consistency and predictability, like uh, windows for, for delivering containers that stay fixed and don't change. Uh, the, the Port of Savannah is doing that now. Uh, two of the ocean carriers have agreed uh, to do that. That alone gives the agricultural exporters uh, a, a more certain window for exports that doesn't change on a daily basis. Those are the kinds of operational changes that we can make in the short term. In the longer term, we simply have to build more capacity and we need a more level playing field. No question about it. Thank you, sir. I think we have a question from the audience. Sean is going to share that with us. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions actually touched on the point Mr. Porcari just made at the end, the, the impact that vessel schedule changes have and, and whether anything could be done about that. Um, there were several, though, on whether the U.S. would consider adjusting uh, truck weights uh, to higher so that containers could be loaded with more weight in them, uh, pointing out that some of the competitors are allowed to load higher in their markets. Thanks. Uh, sure. Uh, the, it's a real issue, and again, a short-term uh, issue today for agricultural exporters that, veal, that vessel sailing schedules uh, are changing dramatically. Um, trade lanes are changing. They're changing the ports that they serve. Uh, in, even when you know that service is coming to a specific port, bringing it to a destination you're trying to get to, you don't have a window that you can respond, uh, uh, a predictable window that you can respond in. So that's the, uh, th that's the uh, uh, first part of it. Um, on, on truck size and weight, uh, as you know, outside of the use of the Stafford Act uh, and other uh, emergency powers, the uh, truck size and weight uh, 
uh, are established at the state level um, with federal oversight. Um, if there are, uh, it's an ongoing discussion with the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration uh, as, as to what and when uh, would make sense. But I know those discussions are going on right now uh, on uh, uh, truck size and weight. I would point out this is a perennial issue. This is not just uh, a short-term issue uh, related to um, uh, the difficulties in exporting right now. The, the larger issue has to be tackled in part through infrastructure that can accommodate the larger weight. Uh, th as a former governor, that's really a big issue. And that's one of the reasons why the states have so much authority over this is because they're the ones who have to repair the roads when they're damaged. I'd also say there's also an interesting issue with reference to the bipartisan infrastructure bill. As you repair bridges, you can strengthen those bridges to actually handle more weight. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's part of what the Department of Transportation is looking at for the long term in terms of greater resilience and greater, greater efficiency in our transportation system. Very good, thank you. Is there a question in the room? And we have a runner with a mic. Somebody come here, run right, right back here. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm a reporter from Canada and I have an off-topic question and I hope the Secretary will indulge me and please forgive me. I saw you the other day at the Canadian Embassy. Uh, while you're here, I'm just curious, um, the Canadians are saying that uh, the export or that the, um, that the market in Puerto Rico will open to PEI potatoes in the next two weeks and that ma U.S. mainland will reopen in the next five weeks after that. Is that accurate and do you have any prediction as to when this will be resolved? You want to take I, this I, offline? Yeah, I'll take, I, I will be happy to talk to you afterwards. If that's okay. No, that's fine. We have questions regarding this topic, I believe, in the room. Bill, I think Tony's coming for you. Right. It's takes me getting used to. Um, a question for a couple of the, the lawmakers, uh, Congressman Garamendi, Congressman uh, Miller. Uh, Johnson. Johnson. I, my best friend in college, his name was Dusty Miller. You have to forgive me. I always do that when you're, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Congressman Dusty Johnson, um, uh, you, were, you were both very diplomatic when it came to the Senate version of the bill. Um, uh, Congressman Johnson, you said we're hoping to bring them to our way of thinking. Now, I'm assuming you're talking about the empties provision in your bill is very specific wording that says these carriers cannot just cancel the bookings and send back empties. Um, how concerned are you that the Senate version does not have that? I understand it addresses it, but doesn't have that as point. Is this something that you're willing to take up in, uh, uh, in negotiations afterwards? I, I, how important is that? I, I think it is quite important. And you know, listen, you get a lot of you guys have more involvement on the Hill than I have. You know, I get it. The House is not going to get everything the House wants in its bill. I mean, I, I hope we're headed to conference. I hope the Senate passes their version quickly, expeditiously. And in conference, they're going to get some of what they want. We're going to get some of what we want. But, but I do think that overwhelmingly the stakeholder community is comfortable with the Garamendi Johnson language. I think they have reviewed it. I think they have vetted it. I think they believe that it does the best job of balancing these interests. And so you're right about the empties, but it's not just the empties. It's also about you know, minimum uh, standards for service that I think are critically important. In general, uh, I think the Senate language will do a lot more to provide FMC rulemaking authority to fill in some of these gaps. But I'm a big believer in, in <laughs> that you know, Congress should not kick too many things to the administration. Let's come together and say with a strong clarion voice what the minimum standards are. What, do, what does reciprocity mean? What does being a common carrier mean? If you're gonna use an American port, what does that mean to the United States Congress with regard to what, how you're gonna step up? And I think we should be able to get to a point uh, in conference or some other legislative mechanism where we put a little bit more meat on that bone than, than perhaps the Senate version uh, intends to. John, am I getting that right? Uh, yes, you got it exactly right, uh, and I won't add to it. We'll get on to the next question. Right. Thank you so much. Sean, did you have one more from Sure. Yeah, online? we have several online, so however many you'd like, Krista. Um, there's a question about the fact that although the 24-7 operations of the ports is certainly welcome, that there's a number of other bottlenecks and whether there can be additional steps taken to make better use of that expansion of hours. It's a great question, and 24-7 uh, is a process, not a light switch. As much as we'd like to turn the entire supply chain into a 24-7 operation overnight, 
it, it is much more than the ports. Uh, it's, it's all the way through the middle mile with uh, the railroads uh, and trucking. Uh, it's the distribution centers, the fulfillment centers, uh, the warehouses. Uh, unless all of that uh, goods movement chain is activated 24 seven, you only have limited uh, uh, impact on the port side doing it. What we're trying to do, quite frankly, is start with the leadership of the ports in Los Angeles and Long Beach who are committed to 24 seven operations uh, and working with some of the major cargo owners that can actually pull cargo and, and, and deliver cargo off peak. And, and through those commitments, those continuing commitments and building on those commitments uh, to drive more off peak use. Uh, that's where the capacity is for the entire goods movement chain uh, in, the, in the short term. Uh, and uh, if you look at the US ports in particular and the goods movement chain in general compared to the rest of the world, uh, it is underutilized capacity compared to how our competitor nations actually operate. Thank you. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, believe it or not, we're kind of we're running out. I wanted to make sure that I did ask this question. I'll start with you, Mr. Secretary, and maybe others can join in. A lot of interest here today, a lot of passion on this topic. Over 1,200 um, participants, I think, on the phone. But still, the main news story, most of the focus is on imports. What can we do in agriculture? What can we do as an industry collectively through the supply chain to continue to raise this issue and help everyone understand? We know you do, Mr. Vaccaro. We know you do. We know the congressman do understand. But to raise the um, awareness, the interest on exports. People don't think about the U.S. being such an export country, but we are. We certainly are in agriculture. What can we do? How do we own this? How do we raise the attention? Well, I think there, there, there are a couple of things. Number one, I think you have to make sure that the jobs aspect of this issue is, is underscored. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, working in companies do not understand and appreciate that what they're doing is actually going to end up someplace outside the United States. And I think it's important incumbent upon policymakers, myself, uh, the members of Congress, John, members of the industry, uh, industry leaders, to make sure that people understand who are working uh, that their job is connected to exports. Number two, uh, this is a, f a little far afield from the response that you may anticipate, but I think it's really important for us to build a sense of trust in the trading relationship that we have with other countries. I think the unfortunate circumstance is when you talk about exports, people think of trade. When they think of trade, they've been encouraged to think that we're getting the short end of the stick on trade agreements, and that puts them in a negative standpoint from an export perspective. So I think it's important for us to, to rebuild a sense of trust in trading relationships. Now, how do you do that? Well, you do it by enforcing trade agreements. Uh, the recent action in dairy uh, with Canada was uh, an effort. Uh, the recent efforts to try to give uh, our Chinese friends the opportunity to live up to their phase one responsibility by purchasing another $17 billion above and beyond what they have to purchase uh, so that they make good on their phase one is another mechanism. Uh, working to reduce trade barriers so recently with uh, India, uh, uh, pork opportunities in India, uh, Vietnam, lo lowering tariffs, making a whole series of, of products more available in that important market. So rebuilding trust. Uh, so I think if we educate people about the economic impact of exports, and then the final thing I would say is uh, there needs to be an, uh, an understanding uh, that it's also a way of branding the United States. Uh, of being able to show uh, th that we are capable of producing quality products, safe products, safe food products. Uh, that is a brand that uh, I think we want to continue to to, uh, to impress upon folks here in this country. Great answer. Mr. Bacaro, do you have anything to add to that? It, it's tough to add anything uh, to what the <laughs> Secretary said, uh, but I would just point out that uh, in a very positive way, the agricultural export industry has been punching above its weight in this discussion, has been very vocal, <laughs> Uh, it's important that you continue to do that. Uh, we've been an agricultural exporting nation since the founding of the Republic. Uh, and uh, some of us in our day-to-day -day lives may not have that connection anymore. Um, working uh, uh, through the media and, and other ways to get the word out uh, that, that it's a vital part of our economy that is linked to uh, jobs all over America um, and that U.S. exports and trade around the world is a critical part uh, of our relationship with the rest of the world is an important message all the way across the board. Thank you so much. Either one of the congressmen, do you have anything to add to, to the comments? I do, but I, John, I, you can the first bite. 
Thank you, Dusty. Um, first of all, Mr. Secretary and Mr. Picari, thank you so very much for uh, your efforts on all of this. Uh, this issue is here and now. Uh, I know Dusty has received calls from his uh, agricultural exporters, and I have, and they're going to lose their markets, as Dusty explained early on. The Port of Oakland's uh, program is very, very good, but it won't be worth a hoot unless there is a ship that will take those containers from that 25-acre site and push the, and put those containers on. I think we need to use every lever available, and that is putting pressure on those ocean shipping companies and say, folks, if you want access, you're going to have to not continue this 70% empty going back to the West. You're going to have to 50%, 40%, whatever the number is. Otherwise, you're not going to come here, or you're going to be at the back of the line waiting to get into the port. There's a lot of levers here. The law that we're proposing will help, but this is here and now. I know a half a dozen farmers and shippers in my district that may very well not, supply, not survive this year because they cannot get their products on a ship and they will lose their markets as was discussed earlier. So let's get with it. Let's use every power we have. Let's twist arms, do whatever necessary to get those folks into the Port of Oakland to pick up those uh, containers. And by the way, 30 days from now isn't going to suffice for at least one major agricultural shipper in this state. Dusty, I'm going to calm down. <laughs> it's up to you. Congressman Dust Johnson. Uh, I think that's exceptionally well said. And I would just note, uh, Chris, so you're right. People have a tendency to think about uh, imports into this country rather than exports. The thing that I love about OSTRA, uh, the bill that John and I have, is that although it really does make the whole system more efficient and in that way it, it helps imports, but it would really most directly and most quickly help American exports, both manufactured goods as well as agricultural goods. And so I would close by saying this, if I had to have our country do three things in the short term to make sure that American exports were getting uh, the attention they deserved, it would be uh, pass OSRA, pass OSRA, and pass OSRA. <laughs> Very good, a nice ending comment. So we're getting the flash now. I think we're out of time. And I asked Sarah Wyant to come up and give us our, our final comments if our panelists will just wait and let Sarah send us off. Well, thank you, Krista, and thanks to all of you who have served on this panel today, uh, not only the earlier panel, but Secretary Vilsack, Mr. Picari, uh, Congressman Garamendi, and Congressman Johnson, thank you so much for all of your input. I think it's very clear to all of us who have been listening, uh, both online and in the room, that there is a lot of passion around this issue, uh, also a lot of frustration but we heard some solutions, some things that are moving forward and some additional asks and ways that we can continue to work collectively in American agriculture to try to find more ways to ease the supply chain congestion, the disruptions, and also to get ag exports moving in the way that we know that they can happen and can get moving to our very precious international customers and so that they can make sure that U.S. agriculture is always considered to be a reliable supplier. Uh, I know that we could keep talking, but we're about out of our uh, total time, so I just want to, in addition to thanking everybody, let you know again that a uh, video of this entire conversation will be posted on agripulse.com uh, within the next couple of days. I'd like to also make sure that to thank again uh, U.S. Dairy Expert Council and the National Milk Producers Federation for making this webinar possible. And I'd like to invite you to all continue to follow um, agripulse.com as we continue to provide comprehensive coverage of this issue. So thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day.